So, 2021 has been uh, quite a year. And as turbulent as it could have been for a lot of us out there, I want to say I feel you. I understand. I've been there. I've had my fair share of ups and downs and changes and whatnot. And um, I just want to end things off on something that's very personal. I guess you could say. I know a lot of us have probably struggled with our identities this year. A lot of us have felt the sedentary nature of this pandemic really settle in and we're able to explore ourselves and discover um, what we like, um, what we don't like. And specifically, in some cases, what our true sexuality is. And in order to celebrate these um, revelatory in incidences, <laughs> I have put together a list of 10 movies that helped me not only form my own identity, but movies that have helped me cement the fact that I do identify as queer, as well as films that are more important in like the broader queer film oeuvre, which is basically like a fancy word for saying conversation or discourse. So in today's video, we are going to be going over 10 of these movies that I that had a profound impact on me as well as things as movies that I think are very important in the broader scheme of queer cinema. But before we get into that, I want to say hello to any new viewers. Hello, any old subscribers. Welcome to my HodgePodge YouTube channel where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. We are going to forgo our calls to action and instead I'm going to give you some YouTube statistics on how I have grown throughout this past year. I very much still use YouTube as um, a hobby, as something just I do for fun <laughs> instead of being my main source of income. So I just want to show you what somebody who's just kind of like doing it on the side very passively has grown within the past year. So in the year of our Lord, 2021, I have gained 140 subscribers. Granted, we've lost a few along the way. We have gained some along the way. I had a cumulative of 1.8 thousand views, like um, watch hours this year, as well as almost 28,000 individual unique views. And I did not earn any money from YouTube this year because I am not monetized. These are the top 10 videos that I had for the year. A lot of them are from years past, but four of them managed to sneak their way onto this list that I have made within the past year, specifically within the first half of the year. The separate piece video, which just very recently crossed over the 900 view threshold, thank you all, as well as the Funko Pop Candyland set video, the Ranking Shits Creek characters video, and the Faye Dunaway Fails sitcom video, some of which I think are some of the best videos that I made this year, so thank you all for making that viewership happen. I very much appreciate you. But enough of that, let's get back to the musings. These are gonna be in absolutely no particular order, like ranking them from like most important to least important. This is very much just a list of 10 that are in no way structured in order of importance. I just wanna, I wanna emphasize, <laughs> I wanna emphasize that. So number one, we're gonna be talking about the movie Maurice. This is based on a novel by E.M. Forrester and brought to the screen by prolific English film director James Ivory, and it is just a beautiful adaptation of the source material, adapting it from a place where it was written in the early 1900s and making it accessible for a 1980s audience. This one does feature a lot of like, oh, the gay guy has to suffer in order to find true happiness tropes, which can come across as, you know, cliche and kind of sad. He does go through quite a lot including heartbreak of somebody who double crosses him, as well as um, hypnotism in order to try to drown out his own homosexuality. However, in the end, it does end up being hopeful because he is able to not only explore and accept his sexuality as something that is unchanging within him, but he finds somebody who is going to accept him for who he is and they can live together unfettered at least in the scope of the fictional world, um, in terms of actual um, early 1900s England, I'm not sure. But this one is beautiful in terms of its production design, its costumes, its score, its cinematography and the performances, everything just kind of like comes together in a beautiful full movie loaf. 
I would say maybe one of the downsides to it is that it does kind of go very, very slow, and the book that it is based on is actually very, very short. So it's amazing how slow the pacing can be at times, but I think it really does give its, it lends itself to like a really proper um, payoff in the end. Number two is Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Is the age gap in Call Me By Your Name too weird for you to stomach? Well, Portrait of a Lady on Fire doesn't have that. The conflicts of these two movies are very similar in terms of time is the one like defining factor of getting the story told and over with and done. It, it is the villain of the story. It is the characters against time. And I know I tout Call Me By Your Name a lot on this channel, or at least I used to, but I think this one is a good alternative because not only is it not MLM, it's to um, women, but it is in French and I think it is a better representation of lust between these two people and how it is blossomed and how it grows between these two women in a shared circumstance. So there's this artist and she is paid to paint this elusive and suicidal woman at the behest of her mother. And because they end up spending so much time together, they end up realizing their true feelings for each other all because they have to stare at each other all day. And so the film is shot very, very intimately, not only during these painting scenes, but like when the light isn't good enough anymore, they are able to actually dive deeper into each other's characters and and it is filmed in such a way that it almost looks like a painting. Something I think this film does a lot better than Call Me By Your Name is how it illustrates the passage of time as well as how there are ghosts lurking around every corner. Because we know the situation isn't going to last forever. Even if the characters want it to, it has to end at some point and that is illustrated through the main artist seeing um, the subject of the painting and how she ends up turning into a ghost at certain moments. This one I hope does not turn you off because it, because it is entirely in French, but don't be afraid to be to, to read, to read some subtitles because it really is a very beautiful and masterful film as well as something that isn't just like MLM content, which I do tout a lot on this channel and I'm looking to expand my horizons. So I'm trying to make this list a little bit more diverse. And I think um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a a good one to check out. Number three is Weekend. This one is a lot more recent. It came out 10 years ago, which doesn't seem all that recent, but is recent in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> this one is relatively plotless. It follows um, these two men who hook up just randomly one weekend and how they are dealing with the fallout and the lust and loneliness that each of their lives instill in one another and how they can potentially fulfill each other by spending time with with one another. It is a very little indie movie. The performances are phenomenal and how they just intersect with one another and how they like try to incorporate each other into each other's lives in such a short amount of time adds to the tragedy of it all. <laughs> and again, this is one where the two characters are at odds and that time is against them, which is something that is kind of, it, it is a running theme throughout <laughs> this list. So I'm sorry about it. This one is buoyed a lot by the performances of the actors and the strength of the script because it doesn't really need a plot necessarily in order to make these characters feel interesting and worth watching. And really, I don't have a lot to say about this one other than I think it's important because it is little. It's not a period piece necessarily. It is just a slice of life story that can just show you how your life can intersect with somebody and how that can change the trajectory of your own thoughts and beliefs and romantic interests. Number four is Boys Don't Cry. I will say I kind of debated putting this one on the list because um, it is very much a um, downer of a movie, let's be nice and say. But this one is particularly important to me because the way, like, where the movie takes place in Falls City, Nebraska, is very close to where I actually grew up and happened only a few years before I was born. And there are actual locations where the actual events took place that I have either been to or have been in close proximity to, and which just further adds to the, I guess, the tragedy and the realness of the situation more. So this one follows Brandon Tina, who is a transgender man looking to foster a life for himself that comes out of, like, it's just trying to seek normalcy in terms of their own identity. And he thinks he finds it in Fall City, Nebraska. He gets a girlfriend, accepts him for who he is, but once all of these people find out the truth, 
they turn on him. And this one also very much uh, suffers from the like barrier queers trope. And so in that way, it kind of is very derivative of other like queer films. But this one is important because it demonstrates representation in a way that I don't think is necessarily harmful, but more at odds with how we consider Midwesterners to act and behave. There is this <laughs> Midwestern nice about people who um, grow up in Nebraska and how this is completely not that. The performances of the cast in this movie are absolutely phenomenal and I think it is one of the best acted movies through and through on this list, but it really will leave you feeling very empty and sad at the end because of the circumstances that the main characters are put in and how all of these things could have just not happened <laughs> because it very is very much part of recent queer history. Number five, come back to the five and dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. Granted, this one might be cheating a little bit because the queer stuff in this movie is kind of like a background point to the main point of the story, which is not to be wasteful with your friendships. So in this one, there is a group of women who are doing a 20th anniversary reunion of their James Dean fan club, and a stranger shows up who claims to know all of this knowledge about all of these women, but they none of them know who she is until it's revealed that she is actually Joe, one of their friends from 50 years ago who underwent a sex change operation and is back because she wanted to remember the times from before. I've already done a video essay on this, so I'm not gonna be talking too much about this particular movie, but I think this one is important because it came around a time when LGBTQ individuals were stigmatized, something that, as we learned from the last entry, did not really change up until very, very, very recently. This is another one of those that is like a very, very little movie, and the queer character, the transgender character in this movie does go through a lot of suffering, especially as before their sex change operation, he struggles a lot with his own sexuality and his own identity, which is something that cannot be over or understated in terms of finding yourself as a person. But if you want to hear more of my thoughts about Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, I will put a thingy up around so you can go watch that video. It's 11 minutes, very short, but it is something that I scripted. I'm talking more extemporaneously today. Number six is Boys in the Band. We're going to the original version of the Boys in the Band, not the most recent remake by Ryan Murphy with like a bunch of um, Wonder Bread. <laughs> this one still has a lot of Wonder Bread in it. This was a lot of people's primary introduction to New York queer life. So this one follows a man who is turning old and how he is questioning not only his own mortality, but how his youth is slipping away in terms of how he needs to be accepted in the gay community. There are some unfortunately dated stereotypes <laughs> throughout this movie, but it really does like capture, a, like it's, it's a snapshot of how queer life was in New York in the 60s. And there are a lot of like very interesting conversations on what it is to, and how it is to be a queer person, how you need to be accepted in the queer community, as well as how people who live on the fringe are expected to live and how if you're not straight, white, or educated, how hard it is to like etch out a living for yourself. And again, this one does not have a lot of plot because it, it is buoyed by the performance of the characters as well as the script and revealing how these characters like interact with one another and mesh and conflict. I, there really is a running theme here. It is these like philosophical think pieces that I think you can kind of tell how things stay the same generation to generation or decade to decade, but how much things are, like how much things do change and how the conversations about queer lives and the significance of how they are integrated into the greater society evolve through time. But it is kind of weird how we end up having almost the same conversation verbatim from generation to generation. As much as we say things are changing, things really do kind of stay the same, especially when we look at these more like contemporary views of queer life as it was in the 60s or the 80s or the early 1900s. Number seven is Moonlight. I mean, La La Land. I mean, Moonlight. This one follows the coming of age of a young black man and how he becomes eventually jaded by his own circumstances and kind of like rejects 
his own homosexuality because of these circumstances. Not only is he bullied at school, his mother is abusive and he has no father figure in his life. And the one friend that he does end up having an intimate experience with sells him up the river to the bullies at school. And this is another one where the gay, the gay character goes through a lot of suffering. But not only are we looking at it through a queer lens, we're looking through it, we're looking at it through a black lens as well. So not only is this important for being a best picture winner that features a black queer character, but it's able to strip away the layers of not only how hard it is to be accepted in society as a queer person, but also how hard it is to make a living for yourself when you are black and impoverished and what it really means to be masculine and how you need to live your life in order to be accepted by society. I remember watching this particular Academy Awards broadcast. I was over at one of my friend's dorm rooms and they announced La La Land as best picture. And I'm like, okay, I'm going home. She did it. But then they texted me later and they're like, did you see that, did you see this mix up? And I was like, no. And at first I was kind of upset that Moonlight was the actual winner of Best Picture that year. But when I actually got to think about it, Moonlight has more to say about life and society than La La Land does. I find myself going to go watch La La Land because of the pretty colors and the fun music, but I find myself going to rewatch Moonlight because it makes me feel something other than like bubblegum happiness. I think films like that, that make you feel something other than happy or just like nothing at all, just to like watch a movie, you go into the experience and able to like empathize with these characters is something that a lot of the movies on this list greatly excel at being able to like help you step into the shoes of somebody that you might not identify with like demographically so while i i personally am not a black man i do identify as a queer person so at least there is that identification factor when it comes to watching this movie but because of how well it is written and directed and filmed I am just able to, for a fleeting two hours, empathize with this character who attempts to lose part of himself because society tells him that he is not going to be accepted, that he needs to change his ways in order to get ahead. And I don't know, I guess it's a little better than uh, Emma Stone eventually finding success, so. Number eight is Edge of Seventeen. Not to be confused with The Edge of Seventeen with Haley Steinfeld and Woody Harrelson. <laughs> this one is on Netflix and one that I have watched more recently than the rest of these movies, but it is about this young man who is coming to terms with his sexuality as he is like graduating from high school and how all of these outer pressures in terms of other gay people that he meets or the girl who is his best friend who is just patiently waiting in the wings for him to like make a move on her and how his relationship with his mother is kind of strained because he is changing too rapidly for his tastes for her tastes, excuse me. There is a lot going on in this movie. And again, it is one of those where the main character doesn't necessarily suffer, but their self-expression is one of those that creates a sense of ennui for the normal straight people around him. But I think this one is very, very important because it is one of the first to show how uncomfortable it is to be a, a fledgling queer person. It also goes to show the horrors of specifically gay sex. Not that it gets like super graphic or anything, but it does show how uncomfortable it can be when you are a virgin or going about like your first gay sexual experiences. It is uncomfortable. It is weird and you might think that you're being taken advantage of or how it just does not feel good but it's one of those movies where experimenting with your identity and your sexuality isn't frowned upon it is very much one of those movies that wraps you up in a warm hug despite some of its more uncomfortable truthy honest moments and i think that's a good way to describe this movie it is very honest about its portrayal of coming out to people, whether that be directly or indirectly. But this one is on Netflix and you should go find it before it is taken off. It's not gonna be taken off anytime soon, but I'm just, I'm just saying, go find it. Number nine is Another Country. I also have a video essay about this one, specifically how it compares the ideas of being a communist and being a queer person in society 
how they intersect and how they can be similarly disgusted, dis- dis- like frowned upon by uh, other people. But this one follows two boys who are friends because one of them is gay and one of them is a communist and how those two things do not necessarily mesh with the greater politics, let's say, of their school. I really like this one mostly because of the philosophical elements between the two boys and how like the pressures of the people around them either force them to adhere to the more societal normalities, but also how those abnormalities are able to form their own notoriety. Like these two people are known because of their outlying factors. And if they had both just been like regular Brits, regular straight white Brits who adhered to the popular political ideologies and sexualities, then they would not be notable. So it is their differences that make them special. This one is based on a play that I really, really like and hope to be in someday, but it's not one of those where the queer character suffers necessarily. They do get stuff taken away from them, societal privileges taken away from them, specifically because of their sexuality, but it's not a case where it's like a barrier gaze trope. They're still able to express their sexuality with very little resistance, relatively speaking. This one is significantly more rare to find. I just happened to find like a DVD copy at um, a half price books. So um, you can find like the trailer and clips online. I don't know if you'd be able to find it um, on any streaming platform, but if you can find it, I do recommend watching it. And lastly, number 10, we have Boy Erased. Boy Erased hits hard specifically for me because I grew up in a Christian environment and I did have a lot of times where I late at night I would try to pray my own homosexuality away because it seemed as though Christianity and homosexuality could not coexist in the same sphere and one had to be shunted out in favor of the other. But this one follows our young protagonist after his accidental outing to his parents and how they send him to a gay conversion therapy compound and how this young man comes to terms with the fact that these these two worlds can coexist despite the fact that all these people, his conversion therapy people and his father who is a pastor are telling him that they can't. This one also very much follows the gay suffering trope, but really points points a spotlight at how hypocritical a lot of these gay conversion therapy camps are. Spoiler, it turns out the guy who is the founder of the gay conversion therapy camp is a former homosexual himself, but it turns out that you can't just get rid of those urges. You cannot just change your biology. You just have to suppress it enough in order to fulfill some societal requirements. There's an SNL sketch that's kind of like very similar to it. I, it's just, it's funny to me how much people will lean into the fact that heterosexuality is the key to having a good life when they might end up being more miserable trying to get rid of this part of them that feels the most natural. And examining this through the eyes of like Christianity, I think is important because a lot of people who grow up religious also end up being queer and end up either embracing the straight side of themselves and adhering to be like a good Christian or getting rid of Christianity altogether to embrace the more queer side of themselves. And it's sad that those two things have to exist in different spheres, not for everybody, before a great number of people when in reality they very well could just coexist and we could call it a day. Why on earth would God make you queer if he didn't want to accept you the way that he made you? It's one of those questions that I struggled with a lot when I was younger and still kind of struggle with today when I have talks with various people, but it's one that I am coming to terms with slowly but surely. So this one hits home particularly with me because of the, because of the personal dilemma that it just presents. And this one was particularly empowering to watch because I saw a lot of myself in it. And so I think I recommend this one specifically to those who felt that they had to choose either their sexuality or their spirituality and why they couldn't 
figure out how they could exist together. But that is my list of the 10 queer films that I think you should be able to check out either on various streaming platforms or if you can like find them out for cheap on like Blu-ray or DVD, I think you should go find them and watch them because not only are they personal and important to me, but they might end up being impersonal and important to you as well. You might see areas of your own life story or your sexuality projected on a screen that you didn't think you needed to see before, but can just open you up to like a whole new discourse with people. You might be able to find the vocabulary and the just the experiences eye-opening and revelatory. And I wanna thank you all for a very productive and growth-filled 2021. There are more videos where stuff like this came from. I have a video about Brandon Jacobs Jenkins uh, play Gloria in the works. I'm currently writing the script for that. But I have a lot of other fun projects to come in 2022. But that is going to do it for this video. If you liked this video, please give it a like, a thumbs up if you will, and hit that subscription notification if you want to see more like this. Um, as I said before, we have the Brandon Jacobs Jenkins video coming out as well as a few other projects. But if you have any video suggestions, please put them in the comments below. I will like, heart it, and interact with you because I like interacting with you. Um, go out there, stay sexy.